Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's, um, okay, so let's pick it up where we um, left off. And uh, let me hide my, hide my, uh, hide my floating meeting controls again. Okay, great. Um, so, okay, so, so, so that was a bit of sort of background context so that you guys can understand pandemics generally speaking now let's talk specifically about what's going going on with COVID. now um again this is a, a work in progress so i left a lot out so you guys interrupt me if you have some questions or if something isn't making sense or you want some more details i'll, I'll maybe i could answer it um but let's talk about what's been going on with the COVID 19 pandemic so we mentioned before we have the agent the host and the environment the agent in this case is sars uh, cov2 um, that's the virus. That virus causes the disease. The disease is COVID-19. Um, so this is uh, following, the, the naming convention here is uh, following a, a new convention. People were worried that um, naming something like the Spanish flu um, was counterproductive, right? So, so um, while it's of course useful to know where the disease began or or, or first broke out, um, so we could go look at how it happened, etc. Um, there turns out there's there's also a lot of downsides that come with that and discrimination and other things. So, so we now have a an international convention for how we name these things. So we no longer call it the you know, the Ebola virus or what have you. So instead, this is the sudden acute respiratory syndrome uh, coronavirus 2 is the virus. Um, and and COVID-19, it was called COVID-19 because it started in 2019. There was a lot of, as with so many things these days, there was a lot of totally insane right-wing insane crazy conspiracies as to where the 19 came from and stuff but but it came from the fact that we first recognized it in the at the end of the calendar year that was 2019 even though it didn't really start catching on the news uh, by and large until uh sort of christmas time and then really until january is when most people started paying attention to it um uh so okay so so, so that that's that's the thing that's the that's the infectious agent. Um, then the host is obviously you and me. Um, and we now know other animals, right? So we saw the gorillas in the San Diego Zoo get infected. We've seen some tigers get infected. We've seen people's cats. We now have evidence of cat of, of domestic cats being infected, dogs, um, et cetera. So, um, so although we're really concerned with us primarily at this point, we also heard of you know the culling of of mink and things of that nature in Scandinavia, um, et cetera. Um, it spreads primarily person to person, and is spread primarily via respiratory drops. Hence the reason why we're probably all going to be wearing masks for a while, just to help help knock down and make sure we have this sucker under control. Um, um, of course, you could cough on your hand. It could absolutely spread by contact, but the primary mode is going to be um, uh, blasting it out into the air and then someone inhaling that um, material. Uh, the highest risk, as we know now, are from, uh, while well, anybody can get it and anybody can die, on average, it's older folks, it's folks that are overweight, it's folks that are immunocompromised or that have some other pre-existing health condition. Maybe they, they have cancer and they're going through some chemotherapy so that their, their immune system is, is kind of whacked, something of that nature. That's within us. That's within the host. And then the environment. The, so it's now become globally distributed. Um, uh, and in fact, um, the efforts to stop air traffic, um, uh, passenger traffic on airplanes and everything were pretty much too little too late um, despite some people saying oh it's a great thing to do um, it's a great thing to do early on and for a few days all that does is buy you a few days to get your health system ready it is not a permanent fix it is not a solution uh, in our global economy for better or worse things will spread what you can do by shutting down air travel is give yourself you know on the order of a week or or so to to get your hospitals and ppe stuff in order 
Uh, lots of complex demographic, lots of political, lots of social factors we're still trying to wrap our heads around. So we don't fully understand that yet, but we know that, that it is quite complex. Uh, and then again, so our triangle, right? So we have our host, that's you and me over there on the left. We have the agent, the infectious agent, that's the, the, the coronavirus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, and then the environment, our mixing in our close proximity, breathing, shared air masses, et cetera, and all those come together to unfortunately produce um, potentially lethal um, uh, consequences if you get infected and, and have a, a, a severe reaction. Um, so again, the, 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 this triangle model is, is not the perfect thing, but it helps us frame. It gives us some frame of reference for attacking different, different areas of our society, different, different um, uh, folks can, can attack different, different elements. And, it, and these, these approaches really, I think, are helpful um, and indeed have proven helpful in public health over the years. Um, okay, so continuing this on and talking more specifically about COVID, uh, once we get infected, or so, sorry, let me sit back. So one, once there's the, the organism out there in the environment, the first level that has to happen is we have to get infected. So, so we can look at the likelihood of that happening. That's called infectivity. Um, then it could get inside us and nothing could happen. Or it could cause um, disease inside of us. That, that propensity to cause disease once it gets inside of us, um, defined as meeting the clinical definitions of what this disease are, uh, problems breathing, problems with circulation, problems with smell, et cetera. That's called pathogenicity. So the infection leads to the, leads to the pathogen uh, or, or the manifestation of the, of, the, of the pathogen. And then virulence is the ability to cause deaths. So as we go from the top here to the bottom, the, the um, consequences are getting uh, greater and greater. And so virulence is the thing we're most worried about. That's the thing that's going to end people's life lives. All of these depend on, on a host of, of variables and factors. So now we're getting to this idea of, okay, well, so it gets into me or, or it might get into me. And then is it going to be a huge problem, little problem, big problem, what? And so that's where we start to get into the models of disease spread. Um, and one of the key numbers here from population, basic population dynamics is the reproductive number. Uh, often referred to as R naught. Um, so cool. Uh, does somebody have a question before, before I keep rambling on about this? Somebody's talking, but I can't hear. Man, it's another one of these. I don't know why. It sounds like somebody's talking, but I can't. Um, let me uh, jump out of my... Uh, I don't think anyone's saying anything. Everyone oh, okay. Muted. Okay. Because it looked like somebody was saying something, but okay, so good. Okay, I can hear Joe talking. So, so at least, at least I know my my it's not my mic, my, not my speakers. Okay, cool. Thanks, man. Um, okay, then I'll keep going. Then, um, so reproductive number R uh, uh, R not is how we is how we articulate the beginning. So every time step through an infection would be an additional time step that could be depending on the the period we're measuring. Could be hours. Could be days. Could be weeks. Um, you would add an additional time step, and that would be R naught is the beginning time. R1 or R sub 1 would be the, the end of the first cycle, R sub 2, et cetera. So we usually talk about R naught in the sense of uh, uh, comparing the, the ability to be transmitted. And so you might have, have seen some articles about this, et cetera. Um, so the basic number here is R naught. R naught is uh, uh, comes from um, multiplying together the probability of getting a transmit. So if two two individuals, if two two people came together, the probability of transmitting for each of those contacts, each of those single contacts, times the total number of contacts that happen, um, and then. And then if I'm infected, how long am I going to be infected? Am I just going to be in, in, infectious for a few hours? Am I going to be infectious for a few days? Am I going to be infectious for 10 days? And so again, especially you might recall early on, there was a lot of um, 
you know, was unclear uh, what these numbers were. And so we, we were basing our, our um, the guidance, the public health guidance about, well, if you're going to travel or you're going to go see your grandma or before you go see your grandma, you need to, you know, isolate for 10 or 14 days that those recommendations are based on assumptions for of these things, right? And you might also remember that we had, we've had rules about, well, if you're going to be indoors, you got to be indoors very quickly and get out. Again, all of this relates to one or more of these, these elements in the equation. <clears throat> Uh, uh, that, that's what we use to calculate R0. Uh, the, so given that, if R is less than one, it's the, 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 the outbreak is going to die away. We're not going to be able to make more of the individuals. And over time, we're going to be making less and less on average. If it is equal to one, it's going to become endemic. In other words, it's going to stay in the population. It's not going to get crazy, but it's also not going to go away. So it's essentially cloning itself and, and staying at a constant level. If R is greater than one, then we have the issue where it's spreading. So, so it's not only just making the same number of, in, uh, making the same number of, of hosts um, contaminated, uh, infected, it's going to make more than that number. And then it'll, it'll play out uh, mathematically, geometrically. So because of that, R0 is a useful statistic. It, it, it helps us understand um, the potential problem, especially early on in a um, outbreak, uh, or early on in, in an epidemic or a pandemic. Um, so again, R0 is the average number of subsequent cases one person or, or, or one infectious individual um, will cause in a completely susceptible population, a completely naive population, a population with no vaccinations, with no exposure to this, to a, a totally brand new population. As we do these interventions, right, as we're introducing the vaccines and more and more, this is why I want people to get more vaccines, we're going to drive that R number down and it's going to be, um, it, it's going to be less likely that it's going to be able to make uh, uh, or have the situation be such that the R is greater than one. Okay, so it's an intrinsic rate of spread of the, or intrinsic rate of growth of the population of infected people. Um, yeah, or, or said this, right? Yeah, okay, so, so again, the goal is for us to make sure that R is less than one. And if it's, if it's greater than one, as it probably is, because we're talking about a pandemic, or whatever, the, the goal is to drive it down to, less than one as fast as possible. So for so here's some some comparisons. So seasonal flu, se seasonal influenza is something like around um, 1.1 to 1.4 kind of in that range of R. Um, and so what does that mean? So let's say we had let's say we had this 1.2 rate, okay? So that's saying that if we had 10 people that were infected, that came to our party that were infected and everybody was totally immunologically naive that on average 12 people 12 new people would would come out of that party being infected um and then you guys can can do the the math so um so influenzas that have gone pandemic before are are higher usually more like about one and a half to two and a half or so uh, for reference um, uh, what do I have here? Uh, so H1N1 was about 1.5, an R of 1.5 to 2. Um, uh, what are some other numbers? Uh, I have Ebola, 1.5. Okay, so Ebola that we freak out about, check out, you know, um, uh, these pandemic influenzas are greater than um, Ebola. Um, measles. So this is one of the things that we've seen outbreaks in recent years as, as the anti-vaxxers and the folks that, that uh, doubt why they should get vaccinated, right? So what, what those folks are saying is that all of you should get vaccinated and very unlikely there'll be a, a um, you know, some kind of um, a bad side effect or something, very unlikely. But what those people, those anti-vaxxers are saying is they want you to take all the burden and they want to get all the benefit. Um, right, so they want their kids protected, 
but you, you all your kids should should you know take the quote unquote risk as minimal as it is. Measles, which we again we've seen outbreaks of this. Measles, the R is fourteen. The recent measles outbreaks, fourteen, not one point four, fourteen. So orders of magnitude more infectious than influenza or any of these things. I mean, it is really, really very easy to spread um, measles. And it's one of the key reasons why we need to make sure people keep being infected, uh, be keep being um, vaccinated. Indeed, this is one of those cases where we've done such a good job. You know, it's almost like we're a victim of our own success, right? And it's hard to get people to... Uh, to really sometimes uh, see that this is an important thing to do. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so I'll just say that. Um, so let's take a quick look at a map here. So then the question is, so what is our current, wh what are we right now? So the R naught is changing over the course of this global pandemic. So let's check out, um, let's check out this map right here. So this is a global map of the world. I, I should actually probably put this, let me put this in the chat for you guys if you are so curious as to want to check it out yourself. Okay, so I just put it in the chat. So if we look at this, uh, this website here, what we're seeing is a global map of the world. And this is uh, showing uh, realized, as of the most recent time this map was updated, uh, uh, realized our, um, our numbers. And so, as we, so if we come over here and I hover over the USA, because we've been doing these, all this great vaccinations, the current estimate today is we're at an R of about 0 0.92. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't pockets in the US that are, that are higher than that, but, but at the scale of the US, we're talking that we've, we've managed to bring it down below, um, below one, which is awesome. And as we look around some other countries, uh, Norway, unfortunately, has a 1.29. So there, it's still spreading a lot there, right? Um, and if we look at uh, uh, India, it's also still spreading 1.11, right? Um, horrible infections there. In fact, this is almost assuredly an underestimate. Well, we'll talk about underestimates in a second, but an underestimate uh, of what's going on in India. And, and the estimates are be because India is so incredibly stressed, as we were early on with not having enough testing, we still don't have enough testing, but especially early on, we didn't have enough testing. Um, we cannot accurately measure the spread. And so we're, we have estimates, but um, in the case of us early on, in the case of India right now, um, almost assuredly that, that R is much higher than, than this estimate. Um, it looks like right now, uh, the Central African Republic has, is taking the worst of it with almost, almost R of two, right? So that's really, really bad. If we look at uh, our friends in Brazil that are having a hard time, they're also greater than one R of 1.1. 1. 1. Um, Okay, yeah, cool. Questions about that? Okay, then I will um, go back to go back to our slideshow. Okay, so this 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 you know again I I probably don't need to um, beat this dead horse here, but but suffice it to say, an R of one means it's going to stay. It's going to be disease is going to hang around to become endemic and and the one person will on average just affect another one but if we had something like an r of four that one person is going to affect four and the next encounter will affect another four and the next encounter will affect another four and, and so on and so forth so you can see how how these uh disasters can just explode overnight essentially and even with a very relatively small difference or what might seem to us like a small difference, we can get a huge change. So if we're talking about a 60 day period, if, if the only thing that changed was R was um, 0 0.1 higher, right? We could go from something on the order of about, about 13,000 infections within two months uh, 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 relative to something like 25,000 infections, right? So you guys, you guys get this. I, I don't need to beat this more. Um, uh, we often see something related to this, which is um, as we take interventions, right, we're going to change the R0. So again, the R0 is assuming a naive population, assuming no interventions, assuming that we're, we, we go in and everybody's un unmasked or what have you. 
And so uh, what we saw um, here um, in Wuhan was uh, uh, right after Christmas, spike going up. The R was estimated as almost as high as four, which is very, very high. So people were getting infected right and left. People were getting ill. <clears throat> this is right when you might remember the, the Chinese government was building this big, massive instant hospital in like 10 days or something. And it was all the talk. And, and that was because there was such a, a large number of people. They didn't have any place to put them. And so, uh, okay, so so exploded. They they started taking very strong measures, not letting anybody come out of their house, et cetera. So then the numbers start, the R number starts to drop, and then they start having people move around a little bit. It goes up a bit, and then they 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 hardcore lock down the city, and then that drives the the R number down. So um, horrible to be stuck in your home, especially if you don't have food and all that kind of other stuff. But but with a very strong response, you can very quickly change um, with an influenza type of situation, you can very quickly change the R uh, value. And that's what happened in China. Um, okay, uh, yeah, so we're, we're going over this. I'll just say that, that um, uh, yeah, so this is an example with HIV, but it's, it's, it's you guys get the idea. I think I'm, I'm talking through this uh, too much. Um, uh, oh, okay. The one thing I do want to say, though, is that uh, so this one of the popular things that we're hearing, you're hearing the press right now is this notion of herd immunity, which is kind of stupid and kind of lame. We can achieve the same thing or even better if people just socially distance and wear their masks and things of that nature. So this notion that herd immunity is some kind of brilliant thing we have to get to is is totally stupid, right? We want to get to, to an, a condition where people aren't getting infected, but we can do as good or better right now if we just simply uh, maintain our hygiene and personal protective uh, equipment. Um, okay, uh, but, but, but obviously as we have more people immune, that's gonna affect the R as well. And this is just a quick example saying that the more people that are immune, uh, uh, the, the faster the R will drop. Um, and again, same thing. I don't think we need to go through this. I, I think you guys get the point. Um, this graph right here is showing the, the transition from um, something being endemic, meaning it happens, but again, it's just a constant number, to the, the epidemic where things are starting to go locally. And then again, if it makes the jump to regional, it can become a pandemic and that can be a long period of time potentially before we get the R to come back down low again. Um, and this is this is sort of just illustrating that. Okay, you guys have seen, I, I, I don't think it's worth our time dwelling on this stuff. Um, uh, yeah, and so, so we've gone through different phases in different countries. Um, a lot of the talk early on was, was flattening the curve. Again, a lot of people ignorant of basic ep epidemiology, not really understanding, people thinking that that was the answer. This was never going to be the answer, right? This was the whole notion of flattening the curve. And so here we have, this is case number, number of people that are that are infected. And this is time on, on the uh, x-axis here. And this display right here is uh, if we did nothing, right? So this is, this is the, just modeling the the R from person to person to person and, and what we think is going to happen. And that's what we want to avoid, right? This is where we have a, a gazillion million people coming to the ER, not enough ER beds. This is what's happening in India as we speak, where, you know, there's just not enough oxygen. People are dying for want of just basic oxygen because the, the, the system has just been completely overwhelmed. So uh, the area of the curve is not necessarily any different between these two, and it, it could be, but it doesn't have to be. But rather the point of flattening the curve isn't to solve the problem as, as many people incorrectly took the lesson. The point of the flattening the curve is just to simply spread out people getting sick so that at any one point in time, we still have hospital beds. We still have response measures. We still have paramedics that can come to your house if you're, if you're um, you know, uh, feeling bad. Um, when we're in this huge peak, we, we, we don't have the capacity to respond. And so the idea of flattening the curve is to give us more time. Just like the idea of, of stopping international travel is not to solve the problem, but it's to give us more time to get prepped. 
And that's the idea of so-called flattening the curve. That was what everybody talked about for it seemed months on end uh, last year. Okay, uh, so um, a few misperceptions before we look at some look at the current situation right now with data, um, and these are these are my personal interpretations. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Maybe there's ones that are really obvious that I forgot to mention here or, or missed. But these are some of the things that I've seen in terms of um, from a disaster perspective, things that we we have maybe um, the general public maybe is not not fully grasped or, or not grasped um, as ideally as we might like. Uh, the first is that, again, as I just mentioned, flattening the curve was all we had to do, right? So when we were in the midst of these stressful times, someone says, hey, we got to do this. And there's sort of the, the idea that, oh, we just we just have to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my God. Oh, I got COVID. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, no, that's a bad joke. Sorry. Um, so uh, you know, sometimes it's like, all we have to do is do this, right? It's like, we're so freaked out and we're so scared. We think that just getting the next step up the stairs is going to be the, the answer. And it's not. Flattening the curve is an important thing to do, but it was but one part of a larger complex thing. Another was that herd immunity in and of itself was the goal. No, the goal is to not have people die. The goal is to stop the, reduce the infection rate reduce the R naught, um, keep the um, everybody healthy. And so because a lot of people incorrectly um, had a little bit of read a couple of news stories, they said, oh, we got to get herd immunity. Therefore, we should get people infected. Insane, completely insane. Well, I don't want to wear a mask because I want to get infected. I don't wanna... Insane, 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 insane. This was I'm not going to talk about it here, but this was the procedure with yellow fever in New Orleans for um, a couple hundred years, and it it killed many, 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 many people. This notion that well, if I survive, I'll be strong, and you know, a real man would survive this. You know, a macho dude would survive this. Mo almost everybody died. So that that that's not that this notion of trying to sprint to hear, herd immunity by infecting people, or you hear people have like these measles parties or chicken pox parties or whatever insane absolutely insane um, that is not the goal the goal is to avoid people getting sick and and getting disease and dying okay uh, physical distancing barriers sanitation are less effective than vaccines no those are very effective if we do them correctly and we're committed to them they can they, they could have gotten us out of this much faster um, uh, also if you guys recall, a lot, a lot of us thought this, like, oh man, because, right, the, the incubation period was first, it was, is it, is it 10 days, is it 14 days, you know, something on that order of magnitude. If we had all just locked ourselves in, stayed in, uh, maybe delivered food to elderly folks or folks that needed food or something, um, uh, for a month, we would have crushed this thing for one month, right? But we couldn't do that. There was such, um, like, well, this is my freedom and how dare you tell me how to behave and this is America and all that kind of stuff, right? So as a consequence, here we are a year and a half later still dealing with this. Um, so it would have been horrible for that month, but we could have gotten out of it. Um, but as a society, we decided that wasn't, uh, that wasn't worth it. And it became a political football and people started interjecting politics into this public health debate. Obviously, the, the the silly notion that vaccines are dangerous, nowhere, everything, whatever we do in life, driving a car has some potential risks, but the vaccines are, a, a gaz, I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but they're a gazillion times safer than getting COVID. And so the notion that they're quote unquote dangerous is just not, it's, it's just the facts don't bear that out. Um, again, we had this false dichotomy between public health on the one hand and economy and the economy going the other, totally insane. It does, it made that, 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 that's that's anti-logical, right? Again, if we had had sucked it up and had contained ourselves, we could have stopped this. And all of this economic damage and all this kind of stuff that everybody's so worried about could have been avoided. All those businesses that went extinct, or at least the vast majority of those businesses that went under, could have persisted for a month. They've had, they struggled with six months, 12 months, et cetera. Um, so, so this notion that there is some kind of dichotomy is a fool's notion. 
and it and and just like with other disasters, the notion is well, we got to just rebuild the homes right now as fast as we can, you know, as opposed to rebuilding more resilient. Again, don't fall into that 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 false narrative, that false dichotomy. Um, uh, the, we we heard this a lot, and in fact, we're we're doing this. America needs to only focus on America, right? That's one of the reasons why India is having such problems as it is now, and other parts of the globe are, are having problems because we've sucked up all the all the vaccines, right? And not that we shouldn't have vaccines, but but in a global pandemic, to not focus on the globe is um, is perhaps not the best way and not the most just way to deal with stuff. Um, and then we also have this um, this tendency that to focus on the heroic individuals. And there's a lot of people doing a lot of fantastic stuff and those are great, we should celebrate them. But it's important to remember that with any disaster, yes, we have heroes, but we also need effective leadership. We also need effective institutions that will respond, you know, the, the, the unsexy day in, day out, uh, getting supplies to a place, getting people uh, the, 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 the aid they require, all that kind of stuff. So, so sometimes we, we, we tend to focus on some um, attractive hero or something. And, uh, and while that's not wrong, it's, it, it can easily lead us astray. Um, okay, so then uh, I'm just gonna talk about now some, some, some data and, and where we are here, unless you guys have questions about the stuff we've just talked about, sort of the, the conceptual introduction to COVID. Is that okay? Is that making sense? Is there anything major I've left out conceptually you guys are wondering about? Uh, well, you're talking about India and how they're getting hit because they don't have vaccines and stuff, but um, weren't they doing fairly well for a while? What, what happened to where they're now having a massive spike? Is it all the protests that were going on? It's hard to know. And so we, I, I don't know exactly. I don't know if we know fully. Uh, absolutely. Part of it has been the um, at least some of it has been the emergence of these more infectious variants. And so one of the things we want to do with the uh, with getting everybody vaccinated or getting every, you know, you know st st stomping down this virus as fast as possible, one is because we don't want people to get sick. But the other reason is because of what, for example, happened in 1918. That first round, uh, the first R, or, or, excuse me, the, the R naught initially in the first wave came through and it was uh, about 1.8, right? So very infectious. The second wave that came through a couple months later, when all the doctors thought this was the worst thing, then it started getting better, the weather changed a little bit. It's like, ah, oh, we, 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 we survived. The second wave, first wave was 1.8. The second wave was 3.8. And then they just got knocked on their butts, right? And that's where most of the people died was not in the first wave, of the 1918 pandemic, but it was in the second, second and subsequent waves. And so that's what we're seeing happen in Brazil and England and all these places. And so what's happened is we've started and we've started some partial controls, right? So some people are wearing masks, some people are staying home, right? So there's been selection pressure put on this organism, on this virus, to become more infectious. Otherwise, it's going to go away. It's either going to disappear or it's going to become more virulent, more, more, more able to infect and you know, get to people, more able to infect them, more able, able to cause disease to, to spread itself. And that seems to be what's going on with all these variants we're seeing around the world. And so, so there's all these very all these names and numbers for them, but most of them, by and large, th there's there's similar you know, happening in different places, places, it's convergent evolution. It's, it's, it's these, these proteins are starting to change in sort of similar ways, even in geographically distinct areas. So it seems like these, these more infectious um, versions of the virus have gotten into India and that's, and that's causing the problems. And so, so it's not just that, I don't mean to say it's just that, but um, that's going on. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that so the, the Indian government has not responded in the, I think uh, the, what the news story I saw yesterday, like eight days or 10 days to any, any um, uh, reporter's request for like, what's going on? So one of the things that a lot of people are dying right now in, in, sit, in cities, they can't get oxygen. So there's a lot of people that aren't maybe massively, you know, 
uh, dying, but if they had sub supplemental oxygen, they may be well be able to live at least for a longer period, if not recover. But they just, there's just like these major, major hospitals can't get oxygen and no one's been able to explain it. And, and the government has just been silent. So there's clearly um, a, a multitude of factors going on. And so part of it is the disease changing. Part of it was people uh, leaving lockdown and, and, and returning to some sense of normalcy because they thought things were not as bad as, you know, they didn't think it could get this bad. And then it's partly some of the, the governmental, um, uh, the ineffectual governmental response. Um, but as to how much of those is which, it, it's, it's hard to know. It, all, it also is very clear that the numbers coming out are, are woefully underreported. And we'll talk about that in, in a sec when I show one of these slides. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Are there other questions you guys had about something that I maybe touched on too quickly or, or blasted over too quickly or you wonder about? Okay, um, so I'll just keep going then. And you guys, again, interrupt me if, if something you're wondering about something or something doesn't make sense. Okay, so uh, uh, we have these vaccines. Uh, the best data we have right now are for the, so right here, if you guys look at, this is just a paper that came out two day, a couple days ago. Wait, two days ago? I can't remember, a couple days ago. Um, but so this is uh, Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine here. This next one is Moderna. Uh, and then this is uh, one from, I think, India. This is the Johnson and Johnson, and this is AstraZeneca, the one that Oxford University has been um, developing. And so, these are so the point of this is just to say things are more complicated than are, are sometimes conveyed in um, a news story that we that we consume, which is mostly how we're hearing about this. That's mostly how I'm hearing about this, right? For example, and so um, we can talk about relative risk reduction. And, and this is this is the number needed to vaccinate. So these are just different epidemi epidemiological terms. All you need to know is that um, the, the blue or the sort of aqua color values are red on this right axis. These orange uh, colored values are red on this um, a golden uh, uh, orangey tan axis. Um, better, better performance of the vaccine uh, if we're looking at the the orange uh, uh, response, it, as we get closer to the bottom, that that's better performance. Off the, when this aqua one closer to the top, are we seeing better performance? Now, what we're seeing here is is the effectiveness. The important thing to note is that these have all been tested in different locations at slightly different times. So it's not as if we tested all of these in the same population with the same exposure, with the same number of, of uh, variants, et cetera. So uh, Moderna and Pfizer were tested earlier on. Uh, Johnson and & Johnson uh, and AstraZeneca have been tested more recently and in, more, in, more, uh, in, in populations that have more of these variants. So you, know, you just glance at this and you go, oh my God, I want, I want to get one of these vaccinations because they're you know 94 percent effective or whatever and these guys are only 70 you know only two-thirds you know you know 67 percent or so effective um point is all of them have a range right all of them have a variation this is i think coefficient of variation i should have written on here i don't remember what it was um so one there's there's variants um two all of these all of these, well, I don't, I'm not sure about the, this middle one, but, but these one, two, three, four, all have, in terms of pre preventing significant disease, the kind of disease that might kill you and send you to the hospital, um, they all have upwards of 90% efficacy of that. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at just the ability to, to not have any um, uh, disease, you know, any of the, the, symptoms present. Um, so these are all, uh, as far as we can tell, for these virus, these vac vaccines, they're all pretty uh, helpful. Um, uh, when we start talking about other vaccines, though, that's not necessarily true. So there are dozens and dozens of vaccines still under development, right? And we need more. We need a lot more. So um, it's important to say that uh, we don't have good numbers on all these, right? 
So um, Sputnik, which is developed by the Russians, um, we I don't believe we still have. So this is this is sorry. I, I said that was from. I said it was from India. It was I should have said Russia. Um, uh, we've not seen the data. We've not seen the hard data, right? We've seen summary data, but we've not seen it. And similarly, uh, we've only recently seen the data from uh, Sinovac, which is one of the Chinese vaccines, which is only 50% effective, um, which, is, which is just, I think 49% is the cutoff from when, you know, so magically, <laughs> they magically made it by one, but by half a percent, right? But it, it definitely is not as effective as um, these other ones that we're seeing. And so, um, so there is a range of efficacy. And again, the Sputnik is, you have to take it on faith that it's 92%, it's, it's unclear. Um, so one of the values, again, in disasters is that we're honest, right? When we screw up, we need to be honest. When, when the bridge doesn't hold up, we need to say the bridge doesn't hold up. It doesn't serve us, doesn't help anyone to lie that the bridge uh, stayed up when it didn't stay up, right? It will, it will, it will one lead us astray and lead us to make incorrect decisions and planning and movements in response to the disaster. But ultimately, what it's going to do when people, because people are going to figure it out at some point, it's going to erode any confidence they have in our ability to respond to the disaster. So we absolutely have to protect our integrity. And you all, as scientists and as professionals, you need to always be protecting your integrity. And if you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, but we need to make sure we don't. And, and sometimes you have to make a best guess and you try your best, but you want to make sure when you do that, say, you know, I'm not sure. It seems like this is the best way to go forward. And to be really honest with uh, the public when, we're, when we don't have, we don't know, we aren't as confident as we might otherwise be. Okay. Uh, uh, income is really dictating by and large what vaccine we're getting. So dark blue here is the UK. The light blue is the European Union. We are the this sort of intermediary blue. And then red is essentially the rest of the world. And so what you see is, um, you know, we're, we're big on, uh, we in the EU, essentially the developed economies, basically Western economies, uh, we are doing a lot of Pfizer, right? We're doing a lot of Moderna, right? Um, uh, these, and, and, okay, so, so this, is, this is what we've uh, arranged to buy, I should say, right? So, that, so not all these have been delivered yet. But um, most of the rest of the world is relying on AstraZeneca. For one, AstraZeneca doesn't need to be refrigerated, so we can transport it. Uh, you know, Pfizer and Moderna need a lot of high-tech equipment to, to keep the vaccines fresh, essentially, so they won't spoil. Um, and they, and then as a consequence, they're also costly. Um, and so most of the world can't, simply can't afford uh, the price or, or can't logistically del, um, um, uh, manage to distribute large numbers of these things. So most of the world is going with things like the AstraZeneca and a lot of the world is counting on that. Um, and then uh, uh, the Russians are trying to use their um, uh, vaccine to garner political support as are the Chinese. Um, this is, and this is, and this is essentially saying that same thing. Um, so right here, you can see the price. So AstraZeneca right here is about $5 a shot. Um, and uh, if we compare it with, let's look at um, where are we, Pfizer, BioNTech Pfizer, $14. Right, so, so Pfizer is about three times the price of AstraZeneca. And if we look at Moderna, that's the one that I got just by luck of the draw, Moderna is about six times the price of AstraZeneca, right? And so it, you know, it, it's, who's, who's gonna be able to afford this? COVAX is the international uh, uh, consortium that's buying vaccines to distribute to, um, countries that don't have the wherewithal to mount their own response or don't have the economic resources. And so um, who, has, who has contracts with that, which is going to supply most of the world, right? Um, and we got uh, uh, AstraZeneca. We have some contracts with Pfizer. We have some contracts with Johnson & Johnson, some with Moderna, and some with um, uh, this GlaxoSmithKline. 
and that's it. At least as of, um, um, I forget when this was, about a month and a half or so ago. Um, and so, uh, right, so we're getting into a numbers game now. We're getting, into, is it affordable? Is it logistically, are we logistically able to deliver it? And are we going to be able to produce enough volume to get everyone on the planet vaccinated, which is what we need? Or at least the vast, 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 vast majority of people on the planet. Uh, as I mentioned, these vaccines are, are become absolutely a political ploy. So this is a story from a couple of weeks ago where Russia um, gave has been giving its vaccine to its sat former satellites, um, and Slovakia said, "Really? I want to check this out." And so they they took one of the vials and they tested it, and it it wasn't it was it wasn't uh, the vaccine, right? And so in this case, this was manufactured from. Uh, another party in India. Um, uh, so setting aside the whole thing about maybe we not don't know exactly how efficacious the Russian vaccine is, it wasn't even that stuff, right? And so Russia got PO'd and they said, you violated the contract. You're not allowed to check if our vaccine is real. So they demanded that they that Slovakia send all of its, all of its, not just that one batch, but all of its uh, vaccines back to Russia. So this is absolutely political. Um, and China's doing the same thing where they're trying to push through their road and belt initiative, uh, the same stuff. And they're trying to, to um, get, um, you know, curry favor and, and pressure countries to use their vaccines, et cetera. Um, the Seychelles did, this is a story from this last weekend, uh, from this past weekend. The Seychelles, this small island country um, uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, was the most successful area in the world for dealing with coronavirus. They sh it's a heavily tourist dependent economy. Um, uh, they shut down completely international travel. And so no one was coming to the country. And so they were all good. But then because they were feeling the pressure, right? And, uh, and this was going on so long, they started allowing travelers to come to the Seychelles a few weeks ago. And to, you know, they, they had to have vaccinations and everything, but it doesn't matter. It's now started to, so the coronavirus has now started to erupt uh, there. And while it's a small island nation, there's only a few hundred thousand residents there, um, but uh, it, it, on a per capita basis, it's now a higher infection rates than India. And so that's one because they allowed stuff to come back, but also it, it, it seems to be part of the answer might also be that they were heavily relying on the Chinese, one, one of the Chinese vaccines that has that only, you know, 50-ish percent efficacy. And so those two things together uh, maybe made them think that they were more protected than they were and that people coming in were being honest that they actually had been um, uh, vaccinated when maybe they had not been. A lot of propaganda was going on, a lot of propaganda happening. I, I don't want to play any, I was originally going to start playing some of these videos, but it was making me too mad, so I didn't. But I'll just suffice it to say that there was a huge amount of propaganda, which should have been a science-based thing, which should have been a public health-based thing, at least primarily. It's naive to think that no politics would creep in in any way, shape, or form. But, but to have the leadership of the country so um, not interested in science and so hobbled by um, how do I say this? Um, it, it, it was, it, I'll just say that there's a lot of misinformation coming out of the highest levels of our government, which, which was um, incredibly disappointing and incredibly disastrous and has fostered the spread of the virus more than we needed to have. Um, we're also seeing a new trend. This is not just with this. We're seeing this with other disasters. We're seeing this with all kinds of stuff related to ESRM. But the new propaganda approach is no longer um, turn off the internet or turn off the flow of information. Back in the day when you know a, a military coup or whatever would happen, you'd go and you'd surround the newspaper, you'd surround the radio station, you'd surround the TV station or whatever. Uh, then, then when the internet started getting big, the initial approach was uh, turn off the power, you know, unplug the internet, turn off the internet, and then, you know, and then we'll we'll control the information. That doesn't work anymore because people get around that. So the current approach used by people in in our country, used by people in other countries, um, used many many times in associated with in association with disasters, et cetera. And we saw this absolutely 
the case with our corona, uh, with our COVID-19, was the notion of you just flood the field with misinformation, disinformation, and you make it hard for people to sift through what's true and what's not. You scream a lot about fake news, you question all the experts, and you constantly flood with fake and cherry-picked and, and misrepresentations of reality, and you just keep doing that. And as a, as a consequence, um, you get people saying things like the media is the virus, and you know the COVID is a scam, and all this just absolute silliness. But we have to realize that this is part of the landscape going forward. We need to deal with this. And whatever career you're going into, and whatever, whatever profession you're going into, we have to have effective responses to this. And we will have our science base, our fact base attempts to communicate um, messed with. And, and it sucks, but that's just that we have to come up with effective ways to cut through the clutter. Um, and then we have the problems that, that um, even our, our supposedly science-based experts are, that were supposedly following science, they, they weren't always following the science, right? So for example, we know now that it, was, it wasn't very dangerous to be out on our beaches, right? To be out in, in public, right? Um, as long as we were socially distanced, that's way safer than other things. And indeed, that, it helped, that, that can help people stay fit, that can help people stay sane, um, et cetera. Uh, they can go pray, they can go meditate, they can go read, et cetera. And the fact that we locked everybody inside and indeed shut down our beaches and shut down our oceans, right? So in California, we also said people couldn't even go in the water. Uh, that was probably not the right thing. And having police on the beach uh, rousing people who were even socially distant, that was, that was not uh, really supported by science, right? Um, and so instead you get people like this lady here on PCH just, you know, pulling off the side of the road because they're desperate to get a little bit of air. Um, uh, we also had other missteps like the CDC. So partly because of the leadership coming out of the White House, but also because of some just screw ups on their, of their own accord, saying things initially when we didn't have enough masks. And so worried about that, understandably worried about that. But, you know, uh, to say, tell people, oh, you don't need to wear masks. That was insane. That was completely insane. Our colleagues in Asia that have dealt with SARS and everything else, I can't tell you how many interviews I heard in, you know, last March, last April, and they're saying, this makes no sense. Of course, masks are going to work. They maybe aren't going to be perfect, but they absolutely are going to help reduce transmission. And the fact that our people were saying, don't do that because they were freaking out that we didn't have enough PPEs for the hospitals was incorrect, right? Um, and so, so there was various missteps. We also were trying to create our own um, uh, diagnostic test, and we screwed that up as opposed to using the one that WHO developed. Um, uh, so those missteps hurt us greatly. So, um, so we had a lot of self-inflicted wounds as the professional scientific community, not just from without. And it's important to realize as we're going forward, again, with whatever your career choice is, um, you know, we can only do what we can, what we can do. And I'm going to, I screw up all the time, as you guys probably know, um, uh, we all make missteps, but in this hyper polarized world, you make one little misstep and, and the anti-reality people, the anti-facts people say, oh, see, see, see. So they'll, they'll, they'll glom onto that one thing. So we have to really redouble our efforts to try to be as accurate and as science-based and as supportive with facts of our decisions. And when we don't have that, we need to be honest that I don't know, but I think we're going to follow this path. Okay, so last thing I just want to look, we just want to look at some of the, the current data. So there's a two, two sources that I think are the most useful, and I'd love to hear from, from you guys as to what you're using. Um, but this is the uh, Institute for Health uh, Medicine, and uh, this is up in Seattle. This is a great source. Now, um, they just published something this weekend, and so this is what they published on their website. And so on Mother's Day, I was talking to my family about this. Um, so just came out. Our, now we, we've heard in, in instances, for example, like in India, that they're under-reporting the, um, the incidence of COVID. We know that early on when we could not get enough diagnostic tests that we were probably under-reporting COVID in, in the US, right? 
they've done, spent a couple months, done a bunch of rigorous statistical modeling and long story short, um, have come up with estimates specific country by country using the estimated death rates that were occurring in the years before COVID-19 to, uh, and applying that to 2020 and 2021 uh, and looking at the discrepancy and then and doing some corrections. And there, there, was, there was some issues with some of the Brazil data. There were some issues with uh, some of the uh, Scandinavian country or two. So they've, they've been cautious, but for most of the world, they've been able to estimate the rates. And so um, our historic rate, like if you went on there, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, we were guesstimating that, or estimating that we were going to get, <clears throat> by the time we're out of this, something on the order of 575-ish thousand, a bit south of 600,000 people dead uh, by like end of summer or so. The real number they think in the U.S. is closer to 900, almost a million people, right? If we take a place like Russia that has also notoriously um, underreported what's going on, um, the, their official numbers are about 100,000. Uh, these guys are now estimating that's closer to 600,000 deaths. Um, and it goes on and on. So if we, if we look at this web, if we look at the website that we'll look at in a second, um, a couple of weeks ago, you would see this. And so I'll just orient you to this website, then I'll, I'll drop the link in the chat. But so this is, uh, this is the data for the world overall. And this is reality. So the solid line is what has happened in fact. The dotted line is their best estimate, their best statistical model for what's going on. You'll notice that there's before today or whatever day you're looking at this, there's a bit of dottedness because some data, is, there's, a, there's a lag in some reporting from some areas and takes, takes a little bit longer in some places. So the dot, the dash line is an estimate. As we go forward, it, it you know it sort of continued on whatever the trajectory was that you know in recent weeks. But then, as with everything else, as with our estimates of sea level rise and carbon in the atmosphere and all, as we go farther and farther out, our our predictions start to vary based on the assumptions of the model. Those assumptions are here. Those assumptions. This red line is that we have the worst situation, right? Uh, green has to do with uh, how we. Uh, and, and worse in terms of infections and in terms of uh, 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 variants and all this kind of stuff. Green is if we are much more aggressive about wearing masks and, and the physical uh, uh, distancing and things of that nature. And so we get a range of predictions here as we go farther out. Again, this is if you looked at this website before this weekend, this is the kind of stuff you'd see. Now, as of this weekend, this is what you see. You see two lines. You see this lower line, which is the official reported number or the official added up numbers from all the individual reporting from across the, the world. In this case, this is a, the global snapshot. But this is their mathematically corrected country by country adjustments. And so what they think the actual death rate is. So again, we're a little bit lagging behind today, but they're estimating that we've, so officially, right, it looks like we're just a bit over 3 million people have died planet-wide because of COVID-19, officially. But they're estimating that it's actually just about 7 million so far. And also that if we project this out into the end of summer, we're talking about seeing 10 million. So we had the question earlier about, hey, what did the, how did the 1918 thing play out, right? That was, you know, 30, ish million people or so um, died from the 1918 uh, flu. So we're getting up to maybe like a third of that, right? So we're starting to get kind of close. The difference is, of course, we have a much larger population. So proportionally, it's, it's a smaller proportion, but that's what's going on. So let me, um, let me uh, click over to this website and let me uh, toss it into chat. You guys can take a quick gander at it. Oh, here it is, sorry. So here is there is that bad boy uh and so um i'll just walk you guys through this really quickly and then we'll we'll finish up with one more website and then we'll we'll end for the end our, our our covid lecture um but so basically so this is a global prediction you can come up here click on this pull down and you can pick whatever country you want if you scroll way down here oops way down here you get to the united states of america and when you go there you can also It'll take a second to think. You can also uh, pick which state you want to look at, 
right? So, so you, you, can, you can come here, you can click this, you could go down, you could pick California if you wanted to, for example. Also, I can come up here, I can turn off any of these things, right? And if I wanna, if I wanna you know, change the mask thing or whatever. And so their default metrics are death rate. The next one is daily rate of deaths. Again, all of these now are added on the, um, the uh, uh, reported number and the estimated reality number. Uh, hospital resource use, um, daily infection rates as reported from the, the testing, uh, mask usage, um, uh, how, how effective people are socially distancing, and there's others in some of the other dialogues, but, but you, guys, you guys get the idea. Um, so I'll give you guys a, I'll give you guys a, a minute or two to, to click around and just, and just play around with that and, uh, and see if you guys uh, have any questions with that. While you're doing that, I'm going to jump back over here. Uh, I'm going to put the next one in the chat since I'm here already. Um, many News organizations, LA Times, Washington Post, various folks are doing this. I think I think the New York Times has one of the most robust um, tools. It's by no means perfect and 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 doesn't do everything, but I think uh, from a national perspective, they they seem to be um, uh, pretty good. So you can look at um, COVID uh, uh, um, vaccine vaccination rates, uh, etc. And so. Uh, uh, Another great one to, to check, and you guys, and I would encourage you guys to look at, would be uh, the New York Times. And I should say, uh, the New York Times, I, would, I encourage all you guys to subscribe to news organizations to support these folks that are generating our news and reporting stuff to us. But most of these entities have, have made the coronavirus related material free to access during the pandemic so that you guys can access this, even if you don't have a particular subscription uh, to these, uh, uh, to, to, to the news organization. Um, and so, uh, uh, the one thing I'll note here is as we're looking, so this is hot spots. If we look at, um, uh, so this is a mix of, of of map as well as tabular, as well as graphical uh, presentations, which are really nice. And you can burrow down and look at all these different predictions. Um, you can look at different time periods and look at different areas. What I'll just note is that um, we do, depending on what data set we're looking at, um, uh, we don't always have data from everywhere. So for example, Texas for a long time was not reporting um, uh, uh, ethnic uh, composition of respondents. And so, so you will get areas right here where it, it says no uh, recently reported cases, um, but in other cases we'll get, um, In other cases, we'll get uh, we'll get gaps at times. Let me see where is um, well. In any event, um, we we sometimes will get uh, gaps in um, areas because not every state or county either reports the data or they don't report it as consistently as do others. So um, so yeah. So there we go. So uh, so that's what's going on with us. So if we take a quick look at um, what do I want to take a quick look? I want to take a quick look at before we go, I want to take a quick look at, at vaccinations. So we are doing relatively well, right? Um, uh, uh, Mongolia is doing fairly well. Um, we have a few countries here and there. Uh, Israel is a little hard to see the scale, but is doing uh, pretty well. Um, the UAE is doing pretty well, but by and large, most of the places on the planet, right, geographically, most of the places on the planet are not doing very well and um, are, are hurting uh, a lot. And so to deal with this pandemic, again, this is a global pandemic, it's out there, we need to deal with this. We need to deal with this, one, because it's a just thing to do. Right? This, it's, it's almost like we had a hurricane that was ongoing and we're trying to put out the hurricane or maybe a better analogy is to put out the wildfire, right? So just because we saved our house, just because we, we, um, 
put out the flames around our house doesn't mean that we're out of the woods, right? So our water supply is still being threatened by that fire. Our power is still being threatened by that fire. The air that we're breathing is still laden with smoke. That's the right analogy. And so um, while it's, it's great that we're getting our, our house in order, we need to really be concerned about the rest of the planet, one, for moral reasons, but two, also for just selfish reasons, right? We need to chomp this virus down before it mutates to a, an extent that it can outwit some of these vaccines, right? So we want to squash this guy as quickly as possible for, for moral reasons and for stopping this event reasons, both. Okay. Um, so uh, that's what I want to say. So just to wrap up in terms of this COVID chat, in terms of COVID in the context of disasters, I'll just say that um, pandemics are indeed like all these other disasters we've talked about. Everyone has a bit of its own unique spin, but, but in gross, large circumstances, these patterns that we've been seeing are also being repeated when we have these uh, global pandemics. Uh, one of the problems that we've had with our COVID story, inconsistent, and uncoordinated oversight of testing supplies and public health guidelines. And that was unfortunately not unique to the US, um, but, but that's what happened here. For most of the pandemic in the US, we had 50 governors and many large city mayors who were essentially left to come up with their own strategies. And so that led to a huge amount of heterogeneity in terms of responses. Um, again, not the ideal way to respond, to respond. The ideal way is to have the best techniques and apply them uniformly. Again, we have to be very careful of America first in a context of something like a pandemic, because by definition, the whole world is affected. We are being affected by the whole, wor whole world, and, and, and only caring about what's happening to us is, um, is an incredibly short-sighted um, uh, way to think about things. Um, and then again, like I said before, the dichotomy of the economy versus the people is false. It's false when we talk about earthquake preparation. It's false when we talk about earthquake recovery. It's false when we talk about volcano risk and, and on and on. And it's also false when it comes to uh, a public health crises like a uh, global pandemic. Okay. So I think, I think that's what I was gonna say. All right, so there we go, boom. That's our that's our last um, that's our last uh, uh, disaster uh, example chat there. Let me um, see if I can kill this thing. Where is this bad boy? Cool. Uh, questions? Do you guys have questions for me? <laughs> 